I said that on the back of the book. So um, if you want to know how he does that, you actually have to buy the book and read the inside. But um, because I've had my piece, I've had my say, I've said what I already thought about the book, I will uh, um, thank you. Um, hold my comments uh, there and open up the floor um, to discussion. Please, um, maybe, Mike, since this is will be directed uh, to you, yeah, we probably need you to stand in order to defend yourself. Um, thank you. Um, and if you could just identify yourself briefly um, and, and, and proceed to your question, uh, that would be great. Uh, Ibrahim Owais, uh, I wish that the reforms uh, in Egypt, whether political or economic, would uh, run with the half the speed the way you delivered your lecture today. Okay. Uh, would have been in a much better uh, situation. But let me ask you, I did not hear, I'm sorry I did not read the book yet, so it may be in the book. Okay. I did not hear any comment about the impact of the rising classes of, or the rising numbers rather, rising numbers of the poor in Egypt. Mm -hmm and how destabilizing it is. And if the current uh, uh, party and leadership in Egypt is really coping with the greater inherent instability because of the rising number of the poor in addition to the unemployed that you had already talked about. Thank you. Do you want to collect questions, or should I do them one on one? Why don't, why, why don't we take maybe uh, say two to three at a time? Okay. Michael Lame, Rethink the Middle East. I want to ask you about Egypt's relation with Israel in a post-Mubarak world. So there was a seri there was a series of wars fought between Egypt and Israel. Now there's been a from 48 to through 73. There's been a peace treaty for 30 years now. What do you see as uh, in a post-Mubarak world, would, it, would a cold peace go into deep freeze? Uh, if there's greater influence of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, how might that affect relations between Egypt and Israel? Um, hello, I'm Lenny Sleiman. I'm from Search for Common Ground. And my question is about which is the precursor to which? Political reform and having good governance and institutions in order to accept economic reform and creating uh, incentives for people? Or does it work the other way around? I know people would want food and jobs and health and education, but with the level of nepotism and corruption present in Egypt, how do you think that is possible? What is Rania? Excuse me. The idea of, of collecting questions is to hope that there will be some common ground. Instead, I think <laughs> now you're supposed to tackle poverty, peace, and reform. Okay. So. All in two minutes or less. Um, Mr. Oasis, um, Oasis' question uh, is, is very important, dealing basically with this issue of the rising number of poor in Egypt. I touched on that a little bit in the context of talking about rising levels of inequality, but it's certainly a topic that warrants greater discussion. The, the World Bank has a, a standard of defining the poor as being the percentage that, or for evaluating uh, the situation of poverty in a country by examining what percentage of the population lives on less than $2 per day. Uh, in Egypt, the figure is about 40% of the population that lives on $2 or less uh, per day. Uh, so there's a profound problem uh, with poverty. Uh, in addition to the problem with unemployment that I was talking about, I mean, to some extent, obviously, there's an overlap between the two, but there's also, to some extent, they're, they're separate uh, groups. The, the government has an economic strategy uh, to try and cope with the challenge of larger numbers of, of poor people. Whether it's an effective strategy is, is debatable, too, but there is an economic strategy there. Uh, in terms of, for example, trying to build more housing, um, uh, low-income housing uh, for poor, particularly in the, the informal neighborhoods surrounding Cairo, providing better infrastructure in those informal neighborhoods, in other words, uh, running water, electricity, and so on. Uh, there are obviously problems with implementation of those um, programs, but nonetheless, there are programs in place to try and address the problems. Uh, there really isn't a political strategy uh, to try and cope with the rising number of poor and the degree of anger and alienation that that community feels. Uh, and it seems to me that essence of a political strategy um, is potentially quite troubling. Because in essence, you have a, a large and growing number of people 
who basically have no stake in the status quo and increasingly see themselves as being victims of the status quo. And that obviously has the potential to be quite disruptive to, you know, to political stability going forward. Uh, so this is a huge challenge, both in the economic and the political arena. With regard to Mr. Lane's question about uh, the future of Egyptian-Israeli relations uh, after Mubarak, uh, my guess is that the transition to a successor to Mubarak will be managed very, very carefully, uh, and that the, the person that receives that post, whether it's Gamal or whether it's Mr. Suleiman or someone else, will be someone who shares um, President Mubarak's views with regard to Arab to Egyptian-Israeli peace. I would be very surprised if there were any dramatic change, um, in part because the transition will be managed so carefully and also in part because the, the U.S.-Egyptian relationship is so closely tied to the Egyptian-Israeli relationship. Um, I think Egyptians would not jeopardize the relationship with the U.S. Um, over relations with Israel. He mentioned that if the role of the Brotherhood were to expand in Egyptian politics, what, that effect, what impact that would have. And I think that, that probably would have an impact, um, but one has to underscore that the Brotherhood's role in Egyptian politics is unlikely to expand anytime soon. So my guess is that um, Egyptian-Israeli relations will remain quite consistent and quite stable in a post-Mubarak period. Uh, with regard to this question of the relationship between political and economic reform, that, that's a fascinating one, and one which I, I tried to allude to in the talk and which I try to talk about in the book as well, uh, that in essence you really can't get sustained economic reform unless there is meaningful political and legal reform. Uh, they are very much integrated with each other, which I, I think was the, the thrust of your question, if I remember correctly. So I think we're, we're agreeing. Uh, that in order for economic growth to occur, essentially you need to have a, a clear and unbiased legal code. You need to have an independent and effective judiciary that's highly professional and highly respected. Uh, you need to have a competent and effective police force that's not corrupt, that can implement those court decisions. You need to have parliamentary mechanisms by which segments within the community that have been disenfranchised by economic reform have a peaceful avenue through which to express their resentments uh, and their aspirations and have those aspirations addressed. Uh, so I, I think we're in agreement on the, the centrality of the link between both political and economic reform. Oh, okay. All right. All right. No, I don't, yeah. Go ahead. Over here. Thank you, Keith Weissman. Uh, so two questions. First of all, as a historian, I don't really like to make comparisons, but one way and one bulwark of the rise of the Ak Party in Turkey has been the support of small and medium-sized Anatolian businesses and their employees. Do you see the emergence of a similar trend among the uh, Islamist groups, particularly the Muslim Brotherhood, in which emerging capitalism, or whatever you want to call it, becomes a vehicle to achieve a greater role in the political process? Is that happening to any degree? That's mm -hmm. one. And the second one, I guess, is one way they can save money is do what the Iranians did. It's just cut down on the conventional military expenses mm -hmm. and go build a nuclear weapon. Um, um, my name is Hevel Qutsi. I'm a journalist from Egypt and a scholar in Water Wilson Center. And I'm working actually on a project about uh, the Bush administration and the tension, uh, democratization as a source of tension between Egypt and United States. And I want to ask you, there were, there were pressure from Bush administration on the Egyptian uh, government uh, regarding democracy. And this pressure just vanished with, uh, with Obama's administration. What exactly uh, your opinion about what Obama's administration is capable of, or are are he willing to push for more pressure on the Egyptian government, and what exactly should be done regarding democracy, and how long will Egypt be able to adopt uh, democratic steps? How long will it take? Thank you. Uh, Mohamed Lotfi. And uh, I have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned four institutions that need support from the United States, including Muslim Brotherhood and uh, the ruling party under Gamal, the son of Mubarak. Uh, uh, given our experience in the Middle East, did you see any other uh, religious-based party that had the reform, Iran, uh, uh, Hamas, 